Good morning, everyone. You can be seated. I know, that's always a bit of a funny part of the service, isn't it? Uh, well, welcome to St. John's. My name's uh, Will Gray. I'm one of the ministers on staff here at St. John's. Uh, we're really glad you joined us, especially uh, if you're new to St. John's or visiting. We'd love to connect with you after the service. Uh, we also want to welcome this morning uh, a Bishop Mike Stewart, uh, who's with us today. Um, Bishop Mike was elected at our synod here in Vancouver last November and was just consecrated as bishop a few weeks ago uh, on March 23rd. And so we're really glad you're with us, Bishop Mike, and we'll get to know him a little more later in the service. Uh, so brothers and sisters, uh, we're the people of God gathered in the name of Christ to worship him in spirit and in truth. So I invite you now to stand and hear as God's word calls us to worship. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge and confess our many sins and wickedness, not concealing them from Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. Rather, we are to confess them with a humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart, so that we may receive forgiveness through God's infinite goodness and mercy. We should always humbly admit our sins before God, and especially when we come together, to give thanks for the great benefits we have received from his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and others those things necessary for our life and our salvation. Let us then with a pure heart and humble voice approach the throne of heavenly grace.
Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy on us, miserable offenders. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises, declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He has empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and the remission of their sins. He pardons all who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. Therefore, let us ask God to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that what we do now may please him, and that the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and that finally we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
This is a Bible reading from Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. This will be found on page 778 of your Pew Bible. Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. It shall come to pass in the later days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and shall decide for strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And the nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But every man shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the people walk, each in the name of his own God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Friends, let's take two minutes. Uh, greet the people next to you, especially looking for someone you don't know today. All right, everyone, if you could start to find your seats. You can continue these conversations after church. Uh, if there's any kids who haven't made their way to the front yet, you can come and join us here. It's good to have a church full of people that enjoy talking to one another. That's a good problem to have. Continue those conversations after the service over tea and coffee. And kids, welcome to church today. It's always wonderful to see you. It always brings me so much joy to be here with you on Sunday mornings. Um, now, I want us to uh, imagine something today, okay? So I need you to imagine with me. You can maybe close your eyes if it helps. But I want you to imagine that you're at school and your parents pick you up uh, to go to, let's say, a doctor's appointment. So your parents pick you up for a doctor's appointment. You go. They bring you back. And when you walk in the door, all of your best friends in your class rush up to you and all start talking at once and go, you won't believe it. While you were away, the most amazing thing happened. It's just like, it's unbelievable, amazing, crazy, never happened before in the whole history of the world. And they're all talking at once and you missed it. How would you feel? How would you feel? You'd feel good? Any other thoughts? <laughs> Clara, how would you feel?
How would you feel, though, if you, if you came back and you missed this amazing, wonderful thing that all of your friends were so excited and happy about? Yeah, Christopher? I'd want them to tell me what it is. You'd want them to tell you what it is. What if they told you and it was something that was, like, totally unbelievable? Like, you couldn't even imagine that that happened. You'd like it rained ice cream, sure. <laughs> would you feel like, would you feel a little disappointed? Yeah. Would you maybe feel a little bit jealous even? Yeah. Would you maybe feel a bit confused? Do you think that you would immediately believe what they told you? Yeah, do you know that this sort of thing actually happened to one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his disciples? After Jesus died and came back to life, he appeared to his disciples, but one of them wasn't there. Do any of you remember his name? Thomas. Yeah, Thomas. He wasn't there. He missed it. When he got back, they all told him, we've seen the Lord. He's alive. And do you know what Thomas said? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I... Before I'm going to believe, I need to see him myself and I need to touch him. I need to see the scars where he died and see him alive for myself. And you know what? This is pretty fair because people who are dead don't usually come back to life again, right? So, so this is kind of understandable for Thomas. But do you know a week later, when all of Jesus' friends were together again, Jesus came and Thomas was there. And do you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't go to Thomas Thomas, tisk, 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 tisk. How could you not believe what your friend said about me? You know what he said? He said, Thomas, look at me, touch me, believe in me, I'm really here. And do you know what? Thomas did believe, and he said the most amazing thing. He said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. God." That's right. Now, you're going to hear more about this story downstairs in your Sunday school classes. So I'm going to pray, but I'm going to pray for all of us today that as we hear God's word, that we would also say in our hearts and minds to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a good father and that you love talking to your children and telling us about who you are and what you've done for us. So we pray for all of us here today, those of us upstairs and downstairs, kids, youth, and adults, as we hear your word, that we would believe in our hearts that you are our Lord and our God. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, kids, we'll see you later.
The second reading this morning is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 13, found on page 959 of your Pew Bibles. Page 959. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you are pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were laid. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who's, who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to, for to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to, to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Just as one body, the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're standing, folks, let me pray. Father, would you open our hearts to hear your word this morning? In Christ's name, amen. Please be seated. If uh, you are new to St. John's, uh, my name is Aaron Roberts. I'm one of the ministers on staff. Um, I know in the, in the service sheets there it says David Short, Canon David Short is preaching this morning. Um, he's a bit unwell, he texted me yesterday, so I'm jumping in for him. Um, he, he, don't feel sorry for him, he's fine, he'll be all right. Um, so, it's not the flu or something. Um, so we're, we're down a canon, uh, we've, gained a, we've gained a bishop, I think that's a pretty good trade. So I reckon we'll be, I reckon we'll be okay this morning. Right, you've heard the reading, we're in 1 Corinthians 12, so... Over the next 20 minutes, we're going to get a grip on everything the Bible has to say about spiritual gifts. It's going to be an historic occasion. <laughs> we're going to learn a small amount about the spiritual gifts this morning. Uh, we know that this is a new section in this chapter because Paul says, now concerning spiritual gifts. Technically, actually, the word gifts is not there. It's sort of, it's more like, 
um, now concerning what it means to be spiritual. Uh, so this now concerning is a phrase he's used before to introduce new sections. So we're into a section that's going to last a couple of chapters about what it means to be spiritual, specifically talking about the gifts. Now, why does Paul want to talk about these things? So let's get into some context. So the church in Corinth uh, had a problem. They had a problem when it came to the spiritual gifts. Paul loved this church, but they were very self Focused, And that played out in the way they thought about the spiritual gifts. Of all of the gifts, they really liked just a couple of them. The more spectacular ones, the more dramatic ones, like speaking in tongues, for example, which Paul will come back to in a chapter or two to talk specifically about. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, their immaturity in the faith Their self-absorption meant that when it came to exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they wanted to do the stuff that put the spotlight on themselves. So the gifts became these look-at-me opportunities. The second reason they like some gifts over others is that they believe the overtly supernatural, more dramatic gifts were extra-spiritual. So if you wanted to come across as being like a really spiritual person, you kind of really wanted these sort of showy sorts of spiritual gifts. And this, of course, created a bit of a class system in the church there. So the Corinthian church has uh, really gotten onto the speaking in tongues thing and then made it a bit of a status symbol. If you spoke in tongues, you were extra spiritual. The church I actually grew up in back in the old country was a bit like this, actually. If you didn't speak in tongues, you were underachieving. Now, of course, we hear this and we're like, oh, Corinth. (laughs) This is, what an outrageous attitude. That's unbelievable. How could they be like that? We would never be like that. (laughs) But let's just for a moment, just for a moment, let's ask ourselves the question, This is a thought experiment. What would be the Christian status markers for a place like St. John's? What would would those be? I thought about it this week. And I think on our most unhealthy days, what would we value as a gift above all others? The one gift to rule them all, so to speak, right? What gift would we elevate that would make others think, wow, we're we're pretty amazing? And I think it's probably something like Bible teaching, isn't it? That's a big amen. (laughs) Amen from over there. (laughs) Right. So if somebody was like a home group leader, for example, or there are some folks that have this uncanny ability to unpack the Word of God, I suspect that we would think they are more spiritual than us. Just so we're clear, that's a terrible attitude. I'm glad a person has a gift to unpack the Bible, but that's a terrible attitude to think they're more spiritual than somebody else. Let's not be that kind of family. Okay, that was all context stuff, and you'll hear more about that over the next few chapters. A bit of background information, but um, just in summary, here it is, one more time, for background. The Corinthian church had singled out a couple of the spiritual gifts. They'd used it to create a bit of a hierarchy in their church, within their group, the spiritual elites and the others. Paul loves this church. He loves this church. So he writes in this letter and he gives them a couple of chapters because he wants to specifically address this issue. Does that all make sense? Great. Let's get right into some details now. So we've got 12, 12, 13 verses here. Um, Rather than zooming in specifically on the speaking in tongues issue, what Paul does is he lays some groundwork for a proper understanding of what it means to be spiritual. So these 12 verses are kind of groundwork stuff, and I think it's brilliant. So what does he have to say? Really big picture, I think he says two things. He says, one, let's be about Jesus when it comes to the gifts. Let's be about Jesus. And two, let's be about each other about each other. 
Let's be about Jesus and let's be about each other. Let's start with let's be about Jesus. And what we'll do is I'm just going to walk you through the first three verses here, okay? So verse one, now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, family, he says, I do not want you to be uninformed. In other, um, in other versions of the Bible, it says, I do not want you to be ignorant, which is, which is the thing I say to people when they come to visit me in my office, actually. Um, <laughs> please come in. Please come in, ignorant person. Um, so what he's saying is this. He's saying, I don't want you to, to live your life just on your feelings and your experiences. That's what you had when you were a pagan. And then he sort of unpacks that a little bit more with verse 2. Verse 2 says, And you know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray by mute idols. So people would go to these pagan temples, and they'd have these quite exciting experiences, sometimes ecstatic experiences, fun times. And Paul says, Remember those idols that you were worshipping and having, those, having fun times. They were non-things. Remember that, right? They were mute. There was no intelligence behind those, those statues, behind those things. You, you were following a nothing. No doubt you had a good time there, but, but don't import that way of being spiritual into your Christian journey now. Verse three, what is Paul getting at here? Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of, the phrasing's a bit odd, I know, but basically he's saying, the only way you can say Jesus is Lord and mean it is if the Holy Spirit is in you. You need a supernatural revelation from God to be able to honestly say, yep, Jesus is Lord. Okay, so those are the first few verses. If you mush all those together, what is Paul trying to get at in these introductory verses? He is saying this, the way you folks used to do your religion that's not how we do it now. It's a world away from Christianity. You want amazing experiences now because that's kind of what you had in the old pagan days. In the old pagan days, you had this idea of what it looked like to be spiritual. And how does it play out for this church in Corinth? Well, we'll find out later. But basically, the Corinthians were trying to um, establish the idea that it was all about exciting, supernatural, crazy stuff. And Paul is saying, no, the test of whether the, you have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it's not whether you speak in tongues or not, because that's the idea they had. The test is if you believe that Jesus is Lord. Let me put it this way. What is the main job of the Holy Spirit? It is to make Jesus known. It's to glorify Jesus. And it's really important this church in Corinth understood that because they were using the Holy Spirit to make themselves known. And their culture, to understand their culture, it was all about fame, it was all about getting well known, it was all about self, and they sort of imported that into the church. So when they got the whole speaking in tongues thing, they're like, look at me, I can do crazy stuff, this is amazing, I'm awesome. The focus was on me, not on Jesus, and Paul needed to correct that error. Okay, I, I'm just going to pause that train of thought for a moment because I'm conscious that in talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, some of you may not know what I'm talking about. So we're going to skip the middle section and we're going to jump to verses 8 to 10, which specifically talk about these gifts. And let me read them for you just to remind you again. To one who is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to the other gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different types of tongues, and still another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay, now I'm going to make a couple of very interesting points. Here we go. First, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, what are they? They are enablings that the Holy Spirit give you. There are enablings that the Holy Spirit gives you. One way to think about them is this. They are like, they're like characteristics of Jesus that the church is supposed to manifest so we can live out Jesus' life and ministry now. So that's my first point. They're characteristics of Jesus that the church, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is supposed to manifest. Second point. The list in 1 Corinthians 12 mentions nine gifts. This is not a complete list. 
These are just examples. There's a different list in Ephesians 4. There's another whole list in Romans 12. And in Romans 12, there's some crossover. It talks about prophecy in the Romans 12 one. But it also includes things like being encouraging and giving and serving, which, which literally is just like being helpful. Another gift in that list is showing mercy. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's not just these nine things. The Holy Spirit enables us in many, many, many ways to help each other, to serve each other. Third, third thing I want to say about that list there, that particular list in 1 Corinthians 12. Notice where Paul puts the gift of speaking in tongues. He puts it dead last. So the gift that the Corinthian church had elevated to be the most important, he puts last. And that's no mistake. Do you see what Paul is trying to communicate here? The Spirit gives us gifts. There's no ladder to climb to like, it's not like a video game where you unlock better gifts as you go along. You know, if you have the gift of healing or administration, that's no less a sign of the Spirit's work than what I'm doing right now. Like as I'm preaching, there are people in that back room there setting out chairs. That's the work of the Spirit in their heart. The gifts of the Spirit do not need to be spectacular to be considered legit. That's really, really important. And this is where the Corinthian church had it so wrong. Okay, let, let's keep moving here. I said at the start of the sermon I had two points. First one is let's be about Jesus, not ourselves. Let's not make these things about ourselves. Second point, let's be about each other. And we'll look at that point quickly now. Okay, verses 4 to 7. So we're in the middle chunk. We've done the start, we've done the end. Let's look at the middle here. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Different kinds of service, the same Lord. Different kinds of working, but the same God works. All of them and all people. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. So what's Paul's big idea here? Well, he's got a number of things, but one of them is this. The source of the gifts are God. And Paul is very Trinitarian. I'm sure you saw that. The source is the Godhead. So we can't take credit for the Spirit's giftedness in us. These gifts are not self-generated. They come from the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Two, there's massive diversity in how the Spirit works in us. It talks about gifts and service and workings. And here again, Paul is trying to undermine the Corinthian emphasis on just a few of the gifts. Three, the other idea, look at who receives the gifts. Verse 7, to each one, each one, everybody receives gifts. We are all recipients of the manifestations of the Spirit. Manifestations means like the, it's like the invisible Spirit of God is made concrete in something that you do in a time and a place through us. Now, for centuries, it was assumed that only a minority of Christians had the gifts, which is clergy, of course. It was called clericalism. Priests did everything. Folks did, other folks just did nothing. Fortunately, we're, we're out of that era now. That era is nonsense. This clearly says, we all have something to offer and contribute to the family of God. So we can't say, oh, I've got nothing to offer, I've got nothing We all have something to offer. Verse 6, God works all of them in all people. God gifts all of us. Folks, very practically, when an opportunity comes up to serve, throw your hat in the ring. You might discover you have a gift. Kids ministry, production team, reading the Bible up front, hospitality, chat to Marion. She's got tons of jobs for people. Don't get too caught up in thinking like, um, what, am I, what, am I, what am I good at? Because that could be a different thing. Honestly, best just to... When the opportunities come, throw your hat in the ring. You might discover you have a spiritual gift that God is going to give you a special propensity for something. Now look at verse 7 again. So, what have we learned? The Godhead gives a huge variety of gifts to everyone. But what's the goal? And this is my main point. What's the goal here? Verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. The source is the Godhead. The goal is the common good. The Corinthian church used the gifts for grandstanding, and Paul says the purpose of the gifts was to make Jesus known and to be helpful to others in the church. 
the common good. And why is that important? Because we need each other. You know that, right? We really, really need each other. I am incompetent when it comes to many, many things we do around here in this place. Like during the, the vestry, you know when they hand out the financial reports? I don't know, I don't understand what's happening. <laughs> like I go to the page, you go to page 12 now, I go to page 12, like I'm, I just fa- like I, I run my finger down the paper. Like I'll pick up the thing and I'll just run my finger down the sheet and I'll stop every now and then and look furtive, you know. Mm, oh, that's nice. Yeah, the securities are doing very well this year. I don't know what a security is. I honestly have got no idea. <laughs> I'll lean over to the person. It's wonderful about the securities, isn't it? One- just wonderful. Who would have thought? I don't know what's happening. But do you know what? Lots of you know. This is how the body of Christ works. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't God amazing? He brings us together, equipping us in lots of different ways to serve each other. You could say it like this. This is a bit cheesy. You may have heard this before. The family of God, we are not a cruise ship where 10% of the people do all the work. We're a battleship. Everybody has a job, and there's plenty to do. Come and talk to us. So I'm going to finish up here super quick. Um, The church in Corinth had some really wacky ideas around what it meant to be spiritual. What's a really spiritual person look like? And one of the issues was they had an unhealthy focus on just a couple of the gifts, very showy gifts. And Paul lays the groundwork here to correct them. He says the Holy Spirit gives gifts to all of us. This is not a complete list here. The source of the gifts is God. So you can't take credit for this stuff. And they're not given to promote your individual status in the church. Uh, Tonight, um, we have soup. We have a soup meal after the service this evening. Whilst I'm preaching, there's going to be some wonderful folk downstairs setting up the soup. That is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit in them, that they would be humble enough to miss most of the service to do that. What I'm doing right now, this is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit as well. Spiritual gifts aren't valued at at how um, spectacular they are, how upfront they are. They're valuable because they honor Christ, they make Christ known, and because they support one another. Amen. Let's continue in prayer together. Please sit or kneel. When I pray, Lord, in your mercy, you are invited to respond with, hear our prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we kneel before you in wonder, and we thank you for your word this morning, for how it once again opens our eyes and reminds us with power and clarity of truth truth about you, about ourselves, and about this church, your church. We praise you, for you have known each of us from before creation. You planned us, you formed us. You have been near us every day of our lives, protecting us. You called us to yourself, called us to faith in you, called us to be here now to meet and learn from each other. You will remain with us till the end of our days and will be our perfectly just and merciful God in eternity when we die. We kneel before you in wonder because you have not only welcomed us into your kingdom, but you have also assigned us, every one of us, and at the same time equipped us to represent you to the world now in this life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We confess, many of us, to having notions or desires to be wealthy, wishing to be rich, wanting even to be known or seen or influential in the world. We praise you, Lord, for your words from the Apostle Paul today that remove the blinders that shield us from seeing that we are already very wealthy, wealthy with gifts you have given to every one of us through your spirit. Lord, may we walk every day with you 
Thank you for your example given to us during your life on earth that in weakness and quietness you healed, taught, and saved. But you often said, now go and don't tell. Your life was not one to seek acclaim. We pray that we will not hoard or sit on the gifts you've given us through your spirit working within us, but we will put them to work, looking to you to guide and empower us, resting in you with the confidence that as you live through us, your spirit will touch, inform, and transform others. And while such events will never make the evening news or social media, lives are being changed for eternity. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Almighty God, we pray for this world, for your world, troubled and in turmoil such as it is. May you reveal your comfort and peace to those affected by violence and disaster. May you give leaders wisdom in their decision-making. Please restrain evil and equip your church in every land to be a refuge for those who need one and a beacon of hope and truth in turbulent, uncertain times such that your light and glory will replace darkness. And help us, Lord, not to tire, but to pray wisely and often, though we may not see the outcomes that we desire in broken places, and possibly we may never see preferred outcomes during our short lifetimes. May we pray with a vision over the horizon, knowing that the story of the world is your story, one that will come to a magnificent end, an incredible finale we can barely imagine, one that will tie all loose ends together, one in which you will be ruler and king, and your glory will be known, and you will be praised by every soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray with thanks for our church. Thank you that if a list were to be made, it would number in the hundreds here at St. John's who in ways small and large help bring you more alive for each other, for guests, and for new folk. Thank you especially for every person and particularly for the youth who contributed to last week's sip down tea being such a joyous occasion. We thank you for the time and commitment already being given by those on the committee to identify a new youth and young adults ministry director. Please give them wisdom. May you call for us, your person, to come. To come and be one who will continue the good work that has already been done with these key and important groups in our church. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. We pray for all the churches in the Anglican Network and for bishops Dan, Stephen, and Mike. We also pray for our clergy here. Give them all wisdom, guide their ways, strengthen them for their tasks, and protect them from evil. Here at St. John's, we thank you and pray for the introducing sessions, introducing Jesus sessions, which began last week and continue this week and next. May the guests attending hear the gospel and in hearing it, understand it, and may they respond in faith. We pray for those in our church who are ill. Please be with Kathy Winkle, Leonard Hoffman, and Grant and Martina Walsh Biggings. May they know your closeness and strength in their present limitations. Thank you for the life of Marlene Thomas, and please give grace and peace to Dylan and Bethan Thomas and their family as they remember with thanks and grieve the loss of their loved mother and grandmother. In a moment of silence, we name others to you for whom your comfort or wisdom is desired. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In closing, we honor you, Lord Jesus. You are the lamb who died for us, setting us free from the encumbering weight of sin and shame. May we rest in you, our King, who rules justly with tireless mercy, protecting and sheltering our hearts during the storms of life, allowing us to step out with confidence to contribute to the life of our church and to share good news with others. We declare it a joy to know you, Lord of life, who has gifted every one of us with true riches of skills, of inclinations to serve, with our involvements being unique, meaningful, powerful, though often quiet and not lauded, to the end that as we go about our lives, you live through us and your glory is evermore proclaimed. We pray that through us, you will become evermore known, that your glory will shine and be seen, understood, and affirmed by many in Vancouver, 
in Canada and from one end of the world to the other. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, 
Almighty God, who has given your only Son to be to us both a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life, give us grace that we may always most thankfully receive his inestimable benefit and also daily endeavor to follow the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of harmony, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, against all the assaults of our enemies so that trusting in your defense, we may not fear the power of any adversary through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And together. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. You may be seated. So just a couple of quick announcements uh, about what's going on in our life together at St. John's. Uh, as always, after the service, we'd invite you to stick around for fellowship. We'll have coffee and tea at the back. Uh, after the service, also we have two courses going on. So Introducing St. John's is in the library uh, at that side in the back, and Catechism is in the cafe room at 11.45. Um, so a couple things happening this week in the life of our church. We have a family potluck, which is this Wednesday evening, April 17th, from 6.15 to 7.30 uh, here at the church. We have some little cards at the back. We'd invite you to pick up if you want to invite someone, maybe a neighbor, family member, uh, these are just really relaxed times to be together as God's people, to enjoy food, to get to know one another more. Uh, we'll have drinks, desserts, activities for kids and youth. We just invite you, bring yourselves, your family, and something to eat to share with everyone else. Uh, and second, we have a refugee welcome night coming up uh, this Saturday, April 20th at 5.30 p.m. at the church. And this is just a time to celebrate God's faithfulness to us and to the refugee friends and families we've welcomed in the last year. There'll be a cultural potluck, storytelling, music. It'll be a wonderful time. And we'd ask you register online uh, by midnight on April 19th, so that's the day before. And the cost is $10 per person or $20 for a whole family. And now I'm going to invite uh, Bishop Mike to come up. And Aaron is going to interview him so we can get to know Bishop Mike a little more. Stand up here. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop Mike, everybody. There he is. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, importantly, why don't you tell us about your family? Will do, brother. Good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a delight to be with you here at St. John's. I want you to know how thankful we are in Annick for St. John's. I don't know where we would be without you. 
And um, we thank God for each and every one of you. It's such a joy to be with you today and to introduce myself a little bit. So, um, yeah, my name is Mike Stewart and I'm married to my wife, Marianne, who unfortunately can't be here today. We've been married for, uh, let me see, 32 years, 32 years now. She gets all the awards, she gets all the medals for sure. Um, we have five, five adult children and three grandchildren. I know, I just don't look old enough for that, do I really? But, uh, we're, from, uh, we're from the UK originally, um, from London. Um, I, uh, I was ordained in the Church of England in London uh, way back in 1989, worked in a couple of churches in the north, uh, northwest of London. And uh, my wife, my children and I, when they were still little, we came to uh, Canada, to Abbotsford in uh, 2002. So what is that, 20, yeah, 20, wow, that's, that's amazing. Uh, that long ago, we came uh, from London where I took the position to be uh, associate priest at St. Matthew's uh, in Abbotsford all that time ago. So did you... Did you, um, did you grow up in a Christian family, or...? Uh, no, I grew up in a very uh, loving family, but not a Christian family at that point. And um, it's testimony to the power of prayer. Mm -hmm. um, if you're here this morning and you're praying for a family member, or if you're praying for a friend to get to know the Lord and to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ, don't give up. Don't give up, keep, keep praying. Um, what happened in my own, my own testimony is that um, when, I was, uh, when I was in my teenage years, living with my parents, the next door neighbor uh, was a Christian, faithful, uh, faithful Christian woman who used to go to the local Church of England church uh, near where I used to live. She was good friends with my mother and began praying for my mother probably for about four years. Uh, we never went to church, never said grace at meals, nothing like that. Um, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, uh, unknown to me at the time, apparently my mum just went round to the neighbour's house, knocked on the door and said, can I come to church with you this morning? Just like that. And um, she started going to church and the Lord met her in a very, very powerful way. And she started to talk to me about God. She started to talk to me about Jesus, which at the time I really didn't want to hear, but I could see a change in my mother's life, which I couldn't explain. And so anyway, one night in the middle of the night, way back in, uh, in November 1980, uh, all of a sudden as a 15 year old, uh, I sat up in the middle of the night and sat up in my bed. My heart was pounding in my chest. And, um, and I just knew that Jesus Christ was in my bedroom and that he'd woken me up. I didn't see him in the way that I'm, I'm seeing you now, but I just knew his presence was in my room. And that this was to do with the kind of stuff that mum had been talking to me about. This was him. Uh, and I knew I could, I could sense too, and not, I couldn't hear anything audible or anything like that, but I just knew that this was Jesus Christ and that he was saying, follow me. Just those two words. And that night, I knelt down by my bed, prayed my first prayer uh, at the age of 15, uh, and asked Jesus into my life. And uh, I've been seeking to follow him ever since. Um, can we? Can you just preach next time? Whatever. <laughs> just wondering no, no. whether we missed no, an opportunity no. here. <laughs> Not at all, mate. That was great this morning. Thank you. Thank uh, you. I have a question good. for you. Yeah. Um, so you're a bishop now. Yes. Obvious question is, what's a bishop? Yeah. Um, well, I've been a bishop for uh, three weeks. So let me speak from my <laughs> from my vast experience here, my wealth of knowledge. Yeah. Um, in the, uh, in the Anglican service, when a, when a bishop is, uh, when a bishop is uh, consecrated, um, the archbishop charges him and says, be to the flock of Christ a shepherd, not a wolf. A shepherd 
and not a wolf. And so a bishop really is a, is a chief shepherd, a chief uh, missionary. Um, one of the greatest theologians that Anglicanism has ever had, Richard Hooker, that you may have heard of, he used to speak about a bishop as being a pastor even under the pastors. Um, and I think really there are three, three priorities for a bishop. Uh, it's to diligently preach the gospel in season and out. Uh, it's to duly administer the holy sacraments and it's to uphold and maintain godly discipline. Now the interesting thing in the Anglican church is that discipline and doctrine are very closely associated with each other. So it's the bishop's job to maintain doctrine and godly order and godly discipline that flows down from right doctrine, if that makes sense. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, you're the bishop for Western Canada, yeah. so just a little, little, little area little there, lip. and um, just little, a cheeky, little cheeky little diocese right there. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So what's, what's, what's your vision? Yeah. What's your vision for what you're doing? What do you want to see happening in the churches? You know, what's your role in all of that? Yeah, thank, thanks, Aaron. So I am uh, what's called suffragan bishop, not suffering, but we'll see. <laughs> but, uh, suffragan, which really means assisting. So it's my job in the West to assist uh, Bishop Dan who oversees the whole of the diocese all across the country. I assist him by primarily looking after churches in the West. So that's from, yeah, that's from uh, just a little dot on the map. Um, that's from Vancouver Island to, to Manitoba. Uh, so yeah, it's a bit of a stretch. Um, part of the challenge of our diocese, right, is we're still pretty young, you know, 10, 11 years old, geographically vast but not necessarily numerically vast. Um, so in that area in the West, we have about 30, say 33 churches, about 90, 90 clergy. And so it's my job to assist Dan um, to do whatever he asks me to do or tells me to do. Um, and uh, to assist him in the, in the vision of the diocese, uh, in the uh, mission of the diocese, in the administrative tasks of the diocese, with a particular focus on caring for the churches and caring for the clergy in the West. So pretty much every weekend, mm -hmm. I'm visiting a different church. Oof. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, we're very grateful. We're Thank very you, grateful brother. that you're our bishop. Um, would Appreciate you, before it. the closing hymn, would you pray for us? Yes, I'd be delighted to. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for the life that you give us and for the new life that you have won for us in Jesus, for his dying and rising again for our salvation. And thank you for pouring out the Holy Spirit upon us and upon your church as we have heard this morning for the common good. Thank you, Lord, for St. John's. Thank you, Lord, for the variety of gifts that you have given your people in this wonderful church. Continue your work here, O oh Lord, we pray. Continue to build your kingdom. Bless your people. Bless your work in this place. Provide all that they need to do all that you have called them to and all that you equip them to, all for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, um, remember to pray for our bishop. Um, becoming a bishop, it feels like a promotion, sounds like a promotion, yeah, but it's, it's from what I can tell, it's a, tre <laughs> <laughs> it's a tremendous sacrifice. So pray for our bishop. Thank, Thank you. you.
God the Father, by whose glory Christ was raised from the dead, strengthen you to walk with him in his risen life. And the blessing of the Lord God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen.